Welcome to the Triple Point Podcast, a podcast for those working at the intersection of weather and climate, technology, and society. We focus on innovators and leaders working to make our communities safe and resilient in the face of a dynamic and ever-changing world. I'm one of your hosts, Jeff Cunningham. And I am Ryan Harris. This month, Jeff is off the air on a business trip, but we have a great show lined up for you. While we couldn't secure Judge Judy for this Triple Point episode, we have the next best thing with two incredibly insightful guests from the world of forensic meteorology. You'll get to hear from two certified consulting meteorologists, T.C. Moore, owner of Atlantic States Weather, and Dan Schreiber, who is a CCM partnered up with JS Held. And both gentlemen share their experiences of weather in the legal and insurance world. Whether you're looking to earn your CCM or just fascinated to hear how weather gets used in the courtroom, this one's an interesting one. For now, on with the show. Hey, so welcome to the Triple Point Podcast. This week, we've got a couple of great guests. We got Dan Schreiber and TC Moore. We're going to talk a little bit about consulting meteorology. Uh, before we dive into that, though, just wanted to kind of go over the news. Jeff's out this week or this month. He's got some other business going on. So looking forward to this conversation with Dan and TC. But looking at the news, lots going on, obviously, in the weather world. Uh, you know, there's always risk involved when it comes to weather and climate matters. Uh, We saw major wildfires sweep across parts of Maui. It's reshaping how electric companies are like Hawaii Electric are looking at these kind of things. We talked a little bit about the fire danger with our guest Alex Hoon last year. And there are some serious issues that these power and these electric companies are facing uh, when it comes to whether they shut off the electricity or the power or how they mitigate uh, the weather and climate risks that are out there. So that that was a big issue. And so um, Hawaii Electric could be facing billions in litigation. We're going to talk a little bit, maybe not necessarily about that specific story, but our two guests are very familiar with these kinds of cases going forward. The other big news that we have been looking at is the Atlantic hurricane season just ballooned in the last week. We had a few named storms pop up uh, recently. Tropical storm Hillary battered California. They got two years worth of rain in some parts of California, particularly like the desert and high mountain regions where they don't typically get a lot of rain. So they had some serious flooding out there. We had tropical storm Harold plow through Texas, uh, somewhere probably around the area that Dan is, is living. So we'll get a report from him on that. And then we are tracking potentially entering the Gulf the Eastern Gulf, uh, a possible system. The National Hurricane Center has us looking at a system that could approach the Florida Peninsula by early next week. So by the time this episode is airing, we'll see if that storm actually comes to fruition. So, you know, no shortage of news in the weather and climate world. And as we'll talk about in this episode, the weather and climate risk on humans, on systems is ever present. And I look forward to diving into that with Dan and TC. So let's dive right into it. TC Moore is an American Meteorological Society or AMS certified consulting meteorologist and military veteran with over 30 years of proven success in consulting, forecasting, research, planning, and policy development in the field of meteorology. Born and raised in North Carolina, and like most meteorologists, always loves storms, winter precipitation events, and has always been a forecaster at heart. He earned his bachelor's and master's at NC State University. Following a lengthy military career, he moved to Raleigh while working for the Pentagon. In 2019, TC bought Atlantic States Weather and has been consulting ever since. He's racked up more than 250 reports, completed on forensic analysis, and is also the co-chair of the AMS board of CCMs. We've also got Dan Schreiber with us. He's another AMS certified consulting meteorologist and a graduate of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona, and a U.S. Air Force veteran. Dan served as a meteorologist while in the Air Force and spent a year attached to a U.S. Army Infantry Division abroad. After serving his country, he started his own meteorology consulting business and later merged it with the global consulting firm JS Held, effectively launching a new service line within the company. Dan has consulted on over 800 files related to insurance claims, risk analysis, and litigious matters involving weather conditions around the world. As I was saying, guys, I've been pegging this episode since we started the Triple Point because I've been really excited to dive into the different consulting, how weather and climate plays a role in these cases. So welcome to the Triple Point podcast, guys. 
Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for asking us to be a part of this. Yeah, so the first question we typically ask our guests, um, and TC, I'll start with you and Dan, uh, have you uh, chime in after that, but how would you describe your journey up to this point? Well, as you indicated in the uh, brief review of my career, most of my meteorology was focused on support of the United States Air Force and the United States Army, whether active duty or working at the Pentagon Department of the Air Force. So focused on operational meteorology to a large part, but then that branches off into program management, budget, uh, all those things that take you away from the true art of meteorology and forecasting. And due to various reasons, I needed to move away from uh, that longstanding relationship with the United States Air Force. And I had an opportunity through networking with the local chapter of the American Meteorological Society. I met a gentleman who uh, had provided a presentation to us on the art and science of forensic consulting meteorology. And I truly had no idea that that even existed. We, we just don't see that. Uh, as you're familiar in, in the Air Force world, you're not ever really going to do that. I was vaguely familiar with the concept of the American Meteorological Society's Certified Consulting Meteorologist, or CCM designation, but we never really needed it in the Air Force or even working as a federal civil service employee. But in talking with this gentleman, Steve Harned, he had built up a consulting business since 2004, and he was looking to kick back and retire and play a little golf. So it was just fortuitous that when I came along asking questions of him, I just wanted to get guidance from him, mentorship on what he was doing and how he came across it. And so you can imagine my surprise when uh, over lunch, he just blurted out, would you like to buy my business, TC? Uh, of course, as a long-time government employee, I had no concept of what it meant to run a business. And in reality, you really don't have a concept of what consulting meteorology, particularly forensic and looking back involves. So I look back and I said, I know nothing about running a business and I know nothing about forensic meteorology. Should I try to do that? And he said, uh, I'll teach you. And that was the key. He was a mentor. He still remains a mentor. We stay in touch every day. He taught me everything about forensic meteorology and, and how to approach it and all the little ins and outs of dealing with attorneys and, and clients and how to write a report and uh, function uh, in the world of the legal civil courts claims process. That's where I ended up today. He, he said, you got to get that CCM. So I worked to get the CCM. And then of course, the first thing that happens is you get asked, uh, well, don't you want to be on the CCM board? And then you get asked, don't you want to be chair of the board? So it's been a, a hectic journey over the last four years. Dan and I talk a lot about how much we've learned and how much we uh, kind of flinch when we look back at an old report from the early days and realized that there is still a lot to learn in this business of forensic consulting. So that's it in a nutshell, Ryan. Jeff and I talk about that a lot, just the essence of learning, continuous learning, and, and always being on that continuous learning journey. That's awesome. Look forward to pulling some of those apart and hearing some of the stories. So Dan, walk us through your journey. Well, uh, you know, uh, TC has got much more experience in the Air Force than I ever did. Um, I did spend about six and a half years uh, in the Air Force, attached to the Army uh, for a little bit of that time. And eventually it just got to the point in my life where the Air Force and I really just needed to part ways for various reasons. Good reasons, but uh, it was just time to go. I needed to figure out what to do with my life. So I applied to the National Weather Service. And actually, I got three or four offers from different offices in the National Weather Service. But it was going to require that I move my family and all of that. And uh, just wasn't at a good point to, to move the family. We're really happy where we live. So uh, I decided I was going to have to start my own business. Originally, I was going to get involved in uh, more of the forecasting operations because that's all I've ever really known. But it just so happened that God had other plans for me and I ended up doing forensics. I just got some random phone calls from potential clients and all of a sudden it just kind of fell in my lap. And it's been an extremely successful career doing that. And I ended up through all that process, getting my certified consulting meteorologist designation and and that has proved to be extremely helpful. Uh, really, I couldn't imagine doing this job without the CCM designation. I wouldn't have met TC without the CCM designation, that's for sure. Really, the only way I can wrap it up, I'm a very religious guy. I think God is great. God is good. He's blessed me and my family. And I do what I, what I can do best, and that's meteorology. So we're all Air Force veterans here, the three of us. And actually, Jeff is too. He's not on the podcast this week. But when I looked at what I want to be when I grow up, 
you know, when I was actually 10 years ago thinking about getting out of the Air Force, I was looking into the forensic meteorology role. And it fascinates me that this is not a role that you hear about a lot in the news necessarily. You don't hear about even in our career field, you know, unless you go to an AMS meeting and you've got the CCM board and you got the things that go on with uh, being a, a CCM. It's not something that at least that I've heard about a lot in my career. So before we kind of roll into that, TC, what is a certified consulting meteorologist? And then I'd like each of you to kind of like, what what does a typical day, week, or month look like for you? So let me start with you, TC, and we'll go to Dan. Well, I usually, uh, when I'm trying to work with and or more importantly, educate a client, and Dan knows this, any of us that's a CCM, we really push that for forensic, looking back, doing investigations and being ready to stand as an expert witness for either deposition or trial, you know, we're up against engineers that have their PE, their professional engineering certification. Attorneys have to pass the bar. So we're looking at what what is it required to be a meteorologist? Well, as you know, anybody can slap a weather page together on Facebook or whatever and call themselves the local weather authority and no one's going to stop them, you know. To be a meteorologist for the federal government, there are requirements, but otherwise there aren't really any, <laughs> any barriers. But so we point out that as a client, if you're an attorney, because our business usually comes through attorneys who are representing clients, either the plaintiff who is claiming damage in a windstorm, for example, or the insurance company who believes that there wasn't damage, the attorney, we, we advise them, you really want a certified consulting meteorologist because that meteorologist has been vetted by the AMS for their training, their experience, their job, their education, and perhaps most importantly, their ethical character, because you're in the legal world where maybe in other parts of meteorology, the ethical considerations aren't necessarily going to be of primary importance. But uh, when you're dealing with a client that may want you to provide them with a hail size, for example, that they want to see... <laughs> And they, uh, they, they kind of nudge you. You have to have the ethical character to say, look, I'm going to give you the science. I'm not going to be able to tell you anything different than what I find. So in my mind, that's the, the true meaning of a CCM. The AMS has a, it takes about a year long process, it's not a simple gimme process. And you go through written exams, oral exams. You have to provide a written essay slash consulting report, like a draft or a sample. And then the board decides whether you meet all the qualifications of a CCM and award you that. And then you get to tell your clients, hey, I got these three letters after my name. That that should have some further emphasis when you stand in front of a judge or a jury to say that this is an expert witness. And as kind of a segue, I can turn it over to Dan and he can explain to you what some of those intricacies of being an expert witness from the scientific field and why that's important in a courtroom situation or, or where lawyers will try to trip you up and get you tossed out, so to speak. So it, exactly like TC said, and, and he's on the CCM board. So he's he's actually more involved in the process of uh, reviewing candidates and, and uh, grading exams and all of that. Uh, the CCM pipeline, it's not like joining a club. It is difficult. It's about a 50% pass rate, maybe 60%, some, something around there. And so it's very challenging. Uh, I did it pre-COVID, uh, and so did TC. I, I've heard it's actually gotten maybe even a little more challenging since then, just because of the, the virtual atmosphere and all of that nowadays. But maybe TC knows more about that. All that being said, TC's exactly right. Anybody can call themselves a meteorologist, just about. And then there are some meteorologists that have a lot of education, but no experience or very little experience. And really what the CCM designation shows is that not only are, are we educated, but we also have experience. And we've also been vetted by peers, right? So it's a board certification, essentially, is, is what it is. And in any other career field, a board certified attorney, a board certified accountant, a board certified this or that, you know, that goes a long way. So it's really important to have that sort of designation. Now, I know plenty of good meteorologists that do not have that designation, but I would certainly encourage folks to go get their CCM if, if they meet the requirements. So let me pull that thread up for a second here. You don't have to dissect a specific case, although I'm going to ask you to maybe go into some of those as you can. I understand there may be some legal limitations there. How do you get the work? How does it come to you? What's your what? How do you attack that case? You know, what's the timeline typically like? What goes into the reporting? You know, are you on the stand and those kind of things kind of walk through from, you know, soup to nuts 
how a typical case goes. So Dan, let me let me continue to pull that thread with you and then TC, you can weigh in as well. Right. So traditionally, most of our caseload comes from attorneys. That has been changing quite a bit recently, at least it, where I work, because historically the work came from attorneys and there was already a, a very large dispute at hand. And as typical in, in the meteorological career field, we're kind of like the last people to be thought of. <laughs> Usually as a disaster is already unfolding, right? Uh, we kind of, kind of just fall to the end, right? And uh, that happens in in litigation a lot. Typically, you know, in fact, most of my colleagues are usually contacted by attorneys uh, directly in suit. And and sometimes it's a rather quick turnaround, maybe a week or two to to do an investigation of a particular weather event at a particular incident location, button it all up. It's basically like writing a thesis. You got to cite all your sources. You got to make sure that your opinion is considered meteorologically acceptable and, and button it all up and make sure it meets all the federal requirements, uh, especially if it's going to federal court. We've been trying to get ahead of the curve a little bit uh, and going directly to the insurance adjusters and some of the other experts, whether they're engineers or construction consultants, accident reconstructionists, uh, you name it, and going directly to the folks that are at the beginning of the insurance claim, the beginning of the investigation, sometimes only a matter of days after that, that claim is made, and, and getting in front of the curve so that we can provide our expertise so the proper decision can be made immediately versus a year or two down the line after hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been spent in legal fees. That's what we're trying to get ahead of. We've been doing it rather successfully, but there's still a lot of room to grow there. Well, that's, I mean, the story of the weather guy being the last to know about something. TC smiling, because I know he saw that in his Air Force career too. I mean, like it's, yeah, I see it in the business world. I see it in the in the military world. It it just amazes me, you know. And I look back at like D Day. The weather guy wasn't the last to be informed about this invasion that was going to happen. And luckily, you know, they did consult with the weather the the weather professionals then, and you know, slipped uh, the invasion a day by based on the limited weather that we had. So, TC, I mean, anything to add there? When I say I purchased a business. Um, some people look at you, well, what'd you actually purchase? Well, <laughs> I purchased the smarts and the brain power and the training of the gentleman, but he also had built up a client list. And amazingly enough, we got together, we sent th something out to all his clients and said, I'm no longer doing it. Or he said, he's no longer doing it. TC's the new guy. And I've trained him, trust him. And so in that case, there's repeat clients once you do something for an attorney. Um, and they like what you do. If they continue to get weather related claims, they're creatures of comfort. They'll come back to you because they know you and what you provide. And so I will get a call from, uh, there's a large law firm in the South that does a lot of defense. And when we say defense, we're usually talking about the insurance companies. And as a side note, one of my kind of anecdotal stories that I tell people when I'm trying to explain what I do, because as you know, there's not many of us, uh, there's probably Dan went about 300 active certified consulting meteorologists, and those don't all do forensic. So there's not many of us. And so that's another reason why clients uh, come back to you. Client calls and says, hey, TC, we've got hurricane claim. Claim is wind damage and storm surge damage. And if it's a client you've worked with, uh, it's a very easy relationship. Uh, you don't ask for much legal or, or contractual business, at least in my case, I'm just like, got it. Okay. You want winds, you want storm surge, you want rainfall in case there was freshwater flooding. And you try to estimate in your head, we charge most of us an hourly rate, just like lawyers or anybody else to do these reports. And I try to come up with an estimate of how long it's going to take me to figure out what were the winds in this case, uh, at this particular property building, what was the storm surge in terms of elevation of water and then provide them an estimate and a date. Sometimes they're open-ended. Other times, as Dan mentioned, they're under a time crunch. And they're like, yeah, we're going to mediation or arbitration next week. We got to have your input. Wow. Okay. Then it's a, a little one-dimensional, I, I tell people sometimes, because then you just hunker down at your desk and you're going to all the sources that we have. And, and we can talk about sources in a little bit. And you try to pull it all together and come up with an opinion, a finding. I believe that this was the amount of winds you had. This is the amount of storm surge. And you tie it all together in a report and you provide it back through word of mouth. 
otherwise. A lot of people ask me, well, how, how, like you did, how do you get your business? Well, I bought some clients, but as you work in a case, sometimes the, the opposing side sees your good work and, and says, hey, after that case, the next one that comes up, uh, they call you out of the blue or one attorney says, hey, I got this weather case. I've never done one before. Who should I call? Now, technically, we are listed on the Association of Certified Meteorologists webpage and within the AMS, and, and I have a webpage that tries to do search engine optimization, but I don't really count on a lot of business through those means. I count on it through word of mouth from doing good work for an attorney and them passing along my good name. And then to close the loop, so you complete a report, sometimes you never hear anything further. You don't know what happened in the case. You don't know what if your report was even used or not. And then two years later, you get a call. Hey, TC, remember that case two years ago? Uh, we're going to need to depose you. And that's where it gets a little sporty because looking back at a report you did two years ago, you hope, man, I hope I knew what I was doing back then. And then preparation for deposition, which is a less than fun part of the job, in my opinion. I will just close it up by saying that, and I define it as being interviewed by the KGB while you're taking the SAT. It's a <laughs> draining process in which they try to trip you up and, and, and find a mistake because ultimately you can have the perfect meteorology analysis. You can have the perfect finding, but if you screw up somewhere in your report or they can find uh, something wrong with your resume or CV anywhere and say, oh, but you you said this, and now you said this, you're, you're providing conflicting statements. You're contradicting yourself. Uh, we're going to get you tossed out and you find yourself uh, excluded, even though your meteorology was perfect. And then of course, if deposition doesn't solve the issue, uh, you could be asked to uh, attend a trial and, and speak as an expert witness. Um, that seems to be a little rarer these days. And in fact, depositions are held virtually instead of traveling to I am scheduled for my first trial, actually, in September in New York. So I'm looking forward to that, finally, after four and a half years. Oh, my goodness. That's a long case there. There's, there's so many threads to pull here. The science of meteorology is uncertain, right? It's highly uncertain. We don't have data everywhere. You both have had to face this, uh, whether it's a hail size or, you know, a flood amount or a precipitation amount or where lightning struck or whatever the case is. So how do you manage that in the deposition process or even in the report process? How do you manage communication of that uncertainty and how do you manage that grilling that you get? We used to get grilled by generals, and you know, in the army and the air force, like, you know, well, what is it going to be? Is it going to be four inches of snow or is it going to be freezing rain? It's going to impact my, you know, my tanks and this and that. I mean, how do you manage that uncertainty? Uh, Dan, let me start with you. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. You know, my military training some of the classified trainings we have to go through as well. They really trained me for how to handle a deposition <laughs> and the grilling that you're going to get and kind of remain unfazed. Uh, I've had attorneys go on and, and do everything they can to try to discredit me for maximum allowable time in federal court, which is seven hours on the record. Only military training would have prepared me for that, I guarantee you. <laughs> so, you know, look, you got to go into these projects, first of all, honest. It is hard to slip up if, if the opinion that you provided is, is actually an honest opinion, right? If you're, if you're making up a story, you're going to slip up somewhere and, and these lawyers are smart. They're going to catch it, right? But if you're honest, you've gone into it honestly, you've gone into it, you've done your due diligence ahead of time, and you're confident about your opinion, it's really hard to, to slip up. The thing is, is you just try not to get distracted by all the distracting questions that come because it is that attorney's job the deposing attorney's job to defend their client, right? And ultimately they're trying to find something you did wrong to expose that maybe your opinion is incorrect. Okay, that's their, they're doing their job. And so, so long as you go into it honestly and you've gone into it, uh, doing your due diligence with a confident opinion, I usually don't find too many issues. So I, I, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it, it does. TC, I mean, uh, how do you how do you manage that uncertainty and, and how do you communicate that in, in the courtroom or on the, on a report? The uncertainty part, how you word that, there are slight variations from the legal perspective on how I might word it in a report or how he might state it. You know, I had an attorney grill me, well, you don't know exactly what the wind was at that building. I said, no, we don't. We didn't have an anemometer at the building. If we did, 
I wouldn't be here because you would have had <laughs> the win. But there's just a wealth of data in this country that no one makes available freely. It's a little hard to find and a little <laughs> clunky and awkward. And that's part of your job as a CCM is to understand the process and where to go. And truthfully, that's a benefit of being a CCM and being within the association because we tend to find little treasure troves of data and then we'll help. Hey, did you know that this network existed in this state? And you're left with several observations of winds in a, uh, a hurricane. You've got ground truth observations. You can use the velocity products, for example. Dan's a little more comfortable on that than me, but you just pull as much of the data as you can together to make a coherent argument that, in my opinion, my finding is that the winds were this or the rainfall is this. Now, some people are more into providing a specific value, 89 miles per hour, 2.2 inches. Uh, I'm generally more comfortable thinking the science is not quite there and I'm going to give a range. You know, winds were 85 to 90 miles an hour. Uh, rainfall was 2.6 to 2.8 inches at your property. And then I have, you know, multiple ground truth observations from Coco Ross community reports, airports. And then, of course, with rainfall, you can use radar to supplement uh, storm total precipitation. There's just a wealth of data and your job is to pull it all together in a sense. And we tend to be self-certifying in a sense. If you've got winds that are all 50, 55 miles an hour, and then right here, you've got a 90 mile an hour wind and there's no meteorological reason that your wind is 90 there, then you exclude that data point because it's not, it's not authoritative. It's not representative. And so you, you try to explain to lawyers and, and others that we do a certain amount of certifying of the data ourselves. We know when uh, data is suspect and Dan's really good at that. He can talk more. He's, he's posted stuff on, on LinkedIn where he's found just incredible examples of mistakes in the data that those who aren't meteorologists wouldn't recognize. And, and that's part of our job is to look at the data and go, oh, that's, that's just not realistic. One time I had someone tell me, oh no, we had 90 mile an hour winds in Florida in, in October. Well, there was no hurricane. There was no thunderstorm. And I went back and looked at the METAR data and the temperature read zero. And I said, well, you tell me when it's actually zero degrees and a hundred mile an hour winds in Florida. <laughs> in it's, Florida. You know, it's a mistake. You, you can't, you can't use that. And, and I'll let Dan talk about, you know, the, the fun with engineers or roofers or adjusters who just grab data without really understanding it and use it to their benefit, but to tie together. So you're left with. In your mind, you come up with what you believe is the best scientific analysis for the amount of rain or the temperature or whatever it is you're tasked with. And then you just say, this is my opinion. Uh, sometimes they like to hear this legal term called to a degree of meteorological certainty. Other times they don't want to hear that. I think Dan, you word it is like more likely than not in some cases, you know, 50% chance or better. I mean, there's ways of looking at it. You just have to be ready to argue and defend however you've had it in your mind to say that this is what happened in this case and recognize that, do I know exactly what the wind was there? No, I don't know because I don't have an anemometer, but to the best of our ability, to the best of with my training experience and education, this is what I believe the meteorological conditions were at this location at this time. Yeah. I've been holding back on this question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Let's dive right in. If you're able to share, you know, legally understand there may be some limitations, but I would love for the audience to hear what are some specific cases slash stories, and, and maybe you don't have to go into a specific case. I mean, you both worked on hundreds of these cases uh, over the last four years. So Dan, let's pull the thread a little bit on some of these cases and, you know, the input that you've provided, the mistakes that you've seen in the data. Let's dive into some of that. Yeah, sure. You know, and it, it's mind boggling how much money that TC and I deal with, not in our own pockets, but that's just up in the air, depending on what happens, you know, the outcome of an insurance claim decision, outcome of a lawsuit. I mean, TC and I work millions and millions and millions of dollars every week. And, and a lot of it boils down to, did a weather event actually happen? The difficult part of that job, I wouldn't say it's difficult. We're used to doing it now, but it, it's difficult when you're first launching into forensic meteorology is let's just say, for example, Hurricane Ian, right? It was a, a category four slash five, depending on how you read the TCR, right? 
Uh, I don't care if it was a Category 4 or 5 hurricane. doesn't matter to me. All I care about is what happened at a very particular point, right? And so you'll see this a lot where adjusters or, or, or experts of other fields will point to Hurricane Ian. Hey, it was a Category 5, 155 mile an hour sustained winds, of course. It ripped the roof off of the house or whatever, you know? And then a meteorologist gets called in, TC or I, or, you know, one of our colleagues get called in and say, okay, yes, the National Hurricane Center said somewhere way out there in the ocean, it was a Category 5, and the maximum sustained wind somewhere within that storm was 155 mile an hour, you know, 157, whatever it is for Category 5, right? But at this property, it was 100 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour. All we care about is what happened at that very particular point. We could have a massive hailstorm move across town. If it didn't hit a property, I don't care, <laughs> you know? And, and so it's really kind of honing in on very, very site-specific weather versus the fact that a storm just happened somewhere, right? Uh, and so it's, it's different from warning for a storm. And I'll get into some specifics, just like you asked, but I, I think it's important for the audience to understand that when we warn for, say, a severe thunderstorm, we just draw a box around the entire storm Maybe it's three counties wide in some of these CWAs, right? And say 60 mile an hour winds and one inch hail, right? That's not what we do in forensics. Just because some storm was warned to be a 60 mile an hour wind producer and a one inch hail producer does not mean that it actually produced that, especially at a very particular site. I've got some closed files that, you know, they're on my, my CV that I, that I share with folks. $900,000 on one particular commercial claim roof damage claim, $900,000 on the table. I got contacted last minute right before an appraisal hearing. It was regarding hail, uh, hail damage. The hailstorm didn't hit the property. The insurance company was about to pay out $900,000 for a storm that didn't even hit the property, right? There was some damage. A lot of the damage was argued by one side as mechanical damage, uh, damage that predated the policy, a bunch of the stuff that has to do with more of the legal realm or manufacturing realm, but, but as far as weather is concerned, there's really three things that matter for an insurance claim, right? Is there some sort of damage? Does that damage kind of fit into the policy, the insurance policy? And was there a storm capable of inflicting those damage within that policy period, right? So there's three things. We, TC and I concentrate on just the weather. We don't care what the policy says. We don't care if there's damage or not. We concentrate on the weather, but weather is crucial. You know, we saved the insurance company $900,000 on that particular claim because there was a misplaced storm report by the National Weather Service. The storm report was misplaced. It was in the wrong position. It put this large hail much closer to the property than was representative. So, of course, folks who want $900,000 for a new roof, they use that to their advantage. And, and they probably didn't know better, right? But they used that to their advantage, and it took a meteorologist coming in to say, hey, look, I'm sorry, the National Weather Service misplaced a report. The storm hit the property. Something tells me, Dan, you, did, you didn't see a, a decent fraction of that 900K <laughs> in your pocket. Oh, um, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's so amazing to me. You yeah. know, when I think about, you know, the missions that we did in the Air Force and the advice that we provided, give them the weather information so that, that the commanders can decide whether they're going to evacuate their aircraft and this and that. I mean, like, it costs money to evacuate. It costs money for communities to evacuate. It costs money to avoid or mitigate weather, but it sometimes costs way more, you know, if those, you know, in, in this case, if those insurance claims are legit, those insurance companies are out a lot of money, right? And so you are in your CCM roles, you're in essence helping save money in in some cases or at least validate that yes this is a legitimate you know case based on the weather information that you have in front of you so tc what interesting story or two do you, do you have to share about your experience as a ccm well i'd like to start by just a general overview of when i came into this business i was probably like a lot of people and you tend to think that maybe insurance companies are the bad guys or whatever. And, and as an, as a side note in our business, by default, you're either going to be representing the plaintiff, which is the person who claims damage, whether it's a hotel owner or a homeowner or someone involved in a car accident or something. And generally defense is the insurance company, but it can subrogate into the building's roofing manufacturer. Is it under warranty or not? So there's a lot of 
things at play, but we like to be unbiased and say, you know, I don't have a bias towards always helping a plaintiff find something against the insurance company. And I don't want to be uh, always uh, considered a shill for the insurance company and just do their bidding and always find them. So there's a little balance that you try to play on both sides. And the example I give it, it is similar to what Dan was saying, you know, my anecdotal story is someone buys a hotel in Florida and doesn't do due diligence and they've got leaky roofs and it most likely came from Irma. Um, but as Dan mentioned, the insurance policy period is very important. Your insurance company is not going to pay for damage if they weren't the company when the damage occurred. So there's a lot of scrambling to, okay, we'll be happy to, if there was wins, the insurance company, we don't care, but we don't want it to be during our insurance period. So unfortunately people buy a hotel the wind that was damaged by a hurricane from four or five years ago. So they'll say, well, we had a thunderstorm last month and that's when it can get amusing because I'll start research and I kid you not, I have high pressure dominates Florida. The whole, the whole state of Florida is dominated by high pressure on that day, not a thunderstorm in sight. And it's like, come on guys, at least pick a day when something was going on. If you're going to state that was your date of loss and then they'll go, oh, we didn't mean that day. We meant, <laughs> so sometimes there's this little trail that you go down of chasing dates. And unfortunately uh, on the flip side, and Dan has more experience, uh, adjusters want to chase down a date that, that they'll start with what they think is damage. And, and then they, they begin to hunt for a date, which to me is backwards. You know, really you should have a claim of a day once you know whether it occurred and, and start us down that process. One of my most interesting, I guess, was kind of a combination. Sometimes I do slip and falls through, uh, an agreement with a company in the in Northeast. So people in New England, New York, they're always slipping and falling on ice and then it's whose fault management or, you know, the apartment complex, did they do their due diligence? But in this case, it was a slip and fall on a cruise ship, which made it challenging. And cruise ship was coming back from the Bahamas. And I thought, well, this is March. Bahamas, well, what, why, why are we even talking about a slip and fall on ice? Well, it was early March and it was coming back to port in New York City. And uh, I guess they washed the decks at night and they hoped that that dries before people get going because evidently decks get very slippery when they're being washed. And unfortunately, a woman had fallen on a cruise ship and she claimed that it was a sheet of ice. And uh, I thought, wow, this is going to be a challenge. First of all, I was like, why is it ice? Is it cold enough? But I realized, yeah, the temperatures were in the thirties uh, on the date that they were pulling into port. And you're like, where am I going to find data for this? But it turns out the ship had, you know, a meteorological sensor system at the very top. That was probably 150 feet. She had fallen at the, uh, I don't know which deck, but it was like 90 feet up. And then it just so happened as I tracked the track of the ship, it went right past a NOAA buoy. And uh, outer New York, uh, outside of the harbor in the, uh, off the shore. And it reported temperatures. So I have a temperature at five feet off the water and a temperature 150 feet up, both of which are above freezing, not a lot. Um, but enough of freezing that I, you know, I was able to write a report that said temperatures were, you know, in the thirties, but they were not freezing and had never gone below freezing. And, you know, I spent some time trying to understand would there be a layer of sub freezing temperatures in between, and there was no meteorological reason for that. So, uh, in this case. The shipping company is very happy because unfortunately it was worded as ice. And when I proved there wasn't ice, you know, the plaintiff doesn't have a case anymore. Uh, whether they fell and got hurt or not, they stated it was ice. Now the same shipping company came to me a year later, another slip and fall on the West coast, uh, off the coast of Vancouver, British Columbia. And in this case, it was just going to be based on water. Um, but the shipping company felt that the water had evaporated Well, they provided a security video. And it was a little frustrating because I could see water in the video as the woman fell. And so I thought, now you're asking me to state that there wasn't water there and I can see it. And, and meteorologically, it all made sense. Uh, temperature was 57, dew point was 57. Any water that had gone down was not evaporating. It was, it was foggy off the coast of British Columbia. That, that water just stayed there and didn't evaporate. Had there been different that would have been one of my bigger challenges to calculate an evaporation rate when I didn't know the area, I didn't know the amount of water. So I was a little happy that ultimately I just tied that one together and said, look, I can't take this case. You're asking me to say there wasn't water and clearly there was. And so it's funny, their, their response was like, well, it was worth a shot. <laughs> and Dan's got those same stories. He's been approached by a lot of adjusters that 
hunt for data and he can tell you more about that. Happens every day. It happens every day. Yeah, every day. <laughs> you both hinted at this, or at least you know, maybe you not even hinted, you've talked about this, but the importance of being honest and unbiased. And so I'm really curious because I've, I've actually seen, uh, Dan, I think you've posted about this, TC, you, you might have as well on LinkedIn, but how many times have you had, you know, so that, that shipping company example is, might be a good one, but how many times have you had a company or a lawyer or whatnot come to you and say, we want to, you know, retain you on this case. And then you have to give them the bad news that the data doesn't support them. How many times has that happened? And, and like, what's, what's the typical reaction? I mean, like in this case, the shipping company, well, it's worth a try, but you know, what are, what are some of the other reactions you get from say lawyers or otherwise? Yeah, it, it happens a lot. There was historically for me, before I joined this new company, it would happen a lot because I, I worked a lot with public adjusters, policyholders, and and so forth. And in Florida, there were some, some insurance issues and I'm not going to get into that, but there was a lot of fraud stuff or just maybe not fraud, but just funny business going on um, in the insurance world, especially with some roof, roofers and contractors and so forth. So there, there was a couple of companies I just had to let go, you know, say, hey, I, I you know, I just, I'm not going to even bother working with you anymore because they were, they were paying me and I was giving them an honest opinion, but, uh, but I felt like they weren't respecting my opinion. Um, and I had actually had one law firm in Florida literally tell me they had filed 60 lawsuits for storm damage claims on a, on a date in which there was no storm. And they were in suit. They were still suing, knowing that there, that there, there wasn't a storm on that day. Yet they're suing for storm damage on that day, right? And so... Yeah, so they are, now we're talking ethics, yeah. Right. Uh, it happens a lot. And it's not just Florida. I mean, it happens a lot, uh, a lot of places. And so as a CCM, you know, look, we're just delivering the news. I've had some clients, when I gave them, quote, the bad news... They were so happy that I gave it to them because it, it was almost like a breath of fresh air hearing somebody honest, <laughs> you know, and they didn't want to waste any more time or waste any more money on something that they were on the losing end of to begin with. Right. And, and so I've had that, but I've had people yell at me too. You know, it, it, it's a very adversarial type job. A lot of folks see forensic meteorology. Oh, that's cool, man. You guys are like detectives and you get to see all this cool stuff. Nobody else gets to see. Well, that's true. But you do deal with a lot of stress, a lot of adversarialness, and sometimes that adversarialness comes from your own side, <laughs> like the people that you're actually, your own client, <laughs> you know? And so it's a mixed bag, you know, but like I said, I'm, I'm a true believer. You just be honest, just be honest, do a good job, be honest, and you will never, ever go wrong by doing that. You might lose that job, you know, that assignment, you'll get another one, you know? <laughs> yeah, we're probably given more of a harsher impression than is true. Most of the calls I've gotten from the plaintiff side, the, the policyholder, whoever thinks um, their attorney, I, I'm just honest with them and say, look, I know you have to learn what they're truly asking for. That shouldn't bias me in any way, but I have to understand, are they looking to see if there was ice? Are they looking to see if the temperatures, what, what do they actually need to make their case? And then I can be honest with them and say, I'm just not going to be able to do that for you. On, uh, and on the defense side, your insurance companies, a lot of times they're just contacting you preemptively. And they, they understand there's a claim and they're going to look, they're going to ask you to look throughout the whole policy period to see if there was any other things that might jump up and bite them later. And what's funny in those cases is you learn rather quickly that in the legal world, you don't send anything, you don't transmit anything until they're ready. Because if you just have it in your own world and you haven't shared anywhere, it's not discoverable. But once you communicate with someone, then it's discoverable. So they'll ask you. Don't send a report. Don't send anything. Just give me a call and tell me what your findings are. And then I break the news to them over the phone. And I say, look, there was some big darn hail <laughs> in this case, you know, on, on several dates. And most of them just good nature to laugh and say, TC, dang it. Why do I even keep you around? You know, but they ultimately <laughs> want you to provide them because they know that you're keeping them out of trouble. If I hadn't have told them about those three dates of large hail in the insurance policy period, I'm sure a meteorologist on the policyholder side was going to find it. So it, it's better for them to know ahead of time and know what they're dealing with. And then they'll just go, just keep that to yourself right now. Just put it on hold. We still get paid, uh, obviously, for doing work. So that's interesting. Sometimes you get paid and then just told, sit on a report because they don't want to see it. And that was just an interesting anecdote with the first couple of times 
Yeah, I sent a PowerPoint slide once with just an arrow indicating I was trying to understand the building structure and the wind direction and stuff. And so I sent a PowerPoint slide, which had nothing more with the, an arrow, but it was a rather large PowerPoint arrow. And the attorney called me ranting. Why did you send that? That looks like a huge wind coming in because it really wasn't a big wind. I was just indicating direction. And she educated me that I shouldn't send anything like that because later it could be discovered and a deposing lawyer could say, look, your own image here shows a giant wind. So it's interesting, the little finesse parts that you learn in dealing with attorneys. And I'm sure Dan has uh, stories too. Every one of our shows, we, we kind of hit on like the psychology aspect. So, I mean, this, this is total psychology when, it, you know, you're deposed or you're writing a report, you're, you're trying to get in the heads of, you know, who you're writing a report for. Uh, and, and I really, so we have a lot of students also listening to this show. And so the information that you've provided is phenomenal. I mean, you know, what, how do you be, how do you become a CCM at, at earlier in the show? The honesty that you need to do this kind of job, you do an honest and fair job and be able to describe, you know, where we're certain, where we're uncertain, uh, you, you really can't go wrong. So the, uh, the last question I want to ask before we kind of dive into a lightning round, um, and Jeff would kill me if I didn't ask a technology question. We've kind of hit on this a little bit, but I, I mean, talk a little bit about some of the technology that, that you use, the sleuthing, the hunting, you know, unfortunately, no, it does not do a very good job of, of making their data discoverable. They're trying to do much better with that. And I think they are getting better. But what are some of the tools that you're using, you know, whether it's radar, historical obs or whatnot? Um, and what are some of the unique pieces of technology that I would have never uh, guessed that you would use for forensic cases? Dan, let me start with you and TC will finish up. Yeah. Uh, well, I will tell you that NOAA does a far superior job than just about any other nation in the world as far as storing their uh, archive data. I've had to do a lot of uh, research for other other nations, and uh, it's it's dang near impossible to find anything. Fortunately, NOAA actually encompasses a lot of other countries and some of their databases, so uh, it it is far superior in my opinion. But like you said, there's probably some room to grow there. You know, everything that I use is what is typically used in the in the general field of meteorology. For example, uh, Gibson Ridge radar software, uh, use it every day. Uh, the NOAA Weather Climate Toolkit, uh, use it every day. Iowa State University has a, a wonderful resource, a, like a database of all the, the historical watches and warnings and METARs and surface. I mean, you, you name it, Iowa State University, the Iowa Environmental Mesonet, IEM phenomenal resource. So um, I don't use too many products. Uh, if you're, if you've done some work in operational meteorology or done some work in the research uh, realm of, of meteorology, I use the same stuff. So easy, easy answer. <laughs> nice. How about UTC? Anything else to add there? Uh, not a lot to add other than to once again, uh, you know, we teased uh, Noah a little bit, but like he said, just an amazing amount of data. I am thankful for Noah. Every day that I do my job, we couldn't do it without it at all. And for the most part, they're responsive when you have an issue. Uh, they have responded multiple times to issues that I've had with some of their products and systems. Just a good set of data, good process. Just sometimes you're like, why is it here and how can I get to it better? Uh, I would just hammer home that mesonets across the country are, are really important. And, and those, you, you kind of have to learn where your mesonets are and, and uh, how to access them. And then put a shout out to like the community networks, like Coco Rise, the community cooperative for rain and hail, snow, you know, that data, sometimes deposing lawyers want to uh, kind of knock that as just private citizens with enthusiasm, but National Weather Service takes pride in, in training, providing some level of equipment to uh, all these private networks included in NOAA's Global Historical Climate Network, you know, GACN. So. If no one thinks it's good enough data, then it should be good enough uh, for us. And then I'll just leave with the interesting thing is there's more and more private companies and networks. Weatherflow is a big one, WeatherStem, and uh, they put a lot of sensors in Florida. And so you'll, you'll come across a lot of good data from Weatherflow, but they're a private company and you'll end up paying should you want that data. Uh, I mean, a limited amount is made free as part of NOAA's uh, summary of the storm. But if you need detailed data, uh, it's interesting to start working out relationships with companies that have data that you can use <laughs> and you're going to have to figure out how to pay for that. 
Well, I don't think you knew this, TC, but Triple Point Podcast is actually affiliate with uh, Weatherflow. So, um, I mean, just the more data that's out there, bottom line, you know, for whether it's Mesonets or, I, you know, through Iowa State or Oklahoma or across other states, it's a big topic. I know the AMS has a, a big topic for that in, in the 2024 annual meeting coming up. So, guys, this has been phenomenal. I really appreciate uh, y'all being on the Triple Point Podcast. Before we let you go, I want to go through our quick lightning round in three quick questions for you. So TC, let me start with you. What is the most memorable weather event in your life? That was one I uh, discussed in a recent association certified meteorologist. We were all asked to recap. It was a blizzard in Virginia. Being the meteorologist that I was, I knew that it was going to hit Wintergreen Ski Resort and bring two feet of snow in actual blizzard conditions, which is a meteorologist uh, you know, people use the word blizzard, but there are certain wind and, and you know, requirements and, and, and those types of things. And I hadn't actually been in a blizzard, but it was going to happen up on the mountain. Just had to get up there before it hit. And due to a variety of reasons, got a late start with the family and got caught. A van slid off the road. It was just horrible parenting on my part. Had to be rescued by an uh, employee of the ski resort and a four-wheel drive vehicle who got us to the top of the mountain. Uh, then it actually turned into a blizzard, 28 inches, power failures, ski lifts weren't running, power went out in the cabin we were at. So it was turning out like this has not been a good trip because I don't know where the van is. It's down the mountain somewhere. <laughs> We've got no power. It's 45 degrees in this uh, cabin. Um, I don't know where my boys are or my son and his friend. They'd gone off in the blizzard <laughs> and we're snowboarding somewhere. But then in the next day, the boys returned safely. They'd been snowboarding just in the woods behind the cabin. The next day, there was 28 inches of what passes for powder on the East Coast. A March sun came out. It was warm. Uh, had a blast skiing and then had to worry about where the van was. And then you dug out your car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it all ended well, but probably there should have been at one point, I should have called knock off or abort on the mission. So that's my favorite weather event. Nice. Um, Nice. How about you, Dan? Uh, I've, I've got a few, but um, well, one of the most memorable, I, I used to work facilities management, maintenance, handyman work, basically, at a Ambry Riddle when I went to school there. And there was a, a blizzard in 2011, and I had to work like, I forget how many hours, but uh, I got paid double overtime, which at the time was $16 an hour for double overtime because it was January 1st, New Year's Day. And that just totally made my day. I thought I was rich. Uh, and, and weather's been paying, weather has been paying my bills ever since. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's hilarious. Yeah. All right. Beach or mountains. Let me stick with you, Dan. And then we'll go to TC. Odd beach. How about you, TC? Uh, mountains all the way. Cause they're cooler and you know, uh, I'm very hot natured. So I'm missing the mountains. Uh, I'm down in Tampa right now. I'm missing the mountains right now. In this, uh, this summer heat, yeah. that's for sure. All right. Uh, what's your superpower TC? Well, like I said, I, uh, I don't like heat and amazingly when a lot of people are cold, I'm not cold. I had to struggle. What is my superpower? But I guess I'd say, uh, I don't get cold very easy. There was an anecdote of standing in a bus stop in Virginia and I'm in my BDUs. You remember BDUs? The sleeves oh, BDUs. rolled up. Yeah. It's 13 degrees outside and I don't have a jacket on. Cause I'm going to get on a bus. It's going to be 80 degrees. So why yep. haul a jacket around? And, and this guy looked at me like, you do realize it's 13 degrees outside. And I said, yeah, but. I'm okay right now. If we stood here for an hour, I might be in trouble. <laughs> but generally, I uh, compared to most people, I don't seem to be affected by cold weather uh, like most people. That's a neat gun. How about you, Dan? I'm the exact opposite. My, I'm I'm solar powered, and the hotter the better. I I went I went <laughs> I, I I went running earlier this summer. We beat the the high, all time high record. It was 115 degrees. I went. I said it's 115 degrees. We're probably not going to ever see this again. I went for a run, you know, standard Air Force mile and a half, just to say I could do it. I thought, I thought I was awesome until I got down the street and, and there was a bunch of roofers on top of a house banging shingles into the roof. And I, I was like, man, I thought I was the only one out here. So anyway, I'm solar powered. I love that heat. And so, yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. There you go. We're, we're, we're off this then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Hey, well, guys, this has been phenomenal. Really appreciate you being on the Triple Point. Talk to us about the consulting meteorology today. It's been a great show. Thank you so much for having us, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Dan. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's Triple Point Podcast. If you liked it, subscribe to our newsletter at triplepointpodcast.com. Give us a shout and a five-star rating on your favorite podcast station and tell your friends about it. 
or you can email us at triplepointpodcast at the number 81degrees.com. Until next time, have a great week. My question is, do Dan and I get a triple point coffee mug? I went on the website and I was like, well, you guys got coffee mugs? Yeah, it's will probably have a coffee mug. But Atlantic State's weather doesn't yet have coffee mugs.